looking at the fire following an explosion at the Exxon Mobil Baytown refinery in Texas early this morning. Four people injured in what authorities called a major industrial accident. The cause of the blast remains under investigation. The guilty verdict in the manslaughter trial of former Minnesota police officer Kim Potter, who mistook her gun for her taser and fatally shot 20-year-old Dante Wright during a traffic stop. Wright's mother sobbing in court. A crowd outside erupting in applause as Potter was led from the courtroom in handcuffs after the judge denied bail. She could face up to 15 years in prison. Surging Omicron and the race to get tested before Christmas visits with loved ones. The line stretching for blocks. Cases nationwide up 75% in the last month. And tonight, the new data that may shed light on the severity of the variant and the new tool doctors have to fight it as the FDA approves its second antiviral pill to treat COVID-19 in as many days. And the Christmas crush, the busiest travel day of the year, with 100 million Americans on the road and another 2 million plus in the skies. At the same time, winter weather strikes, a monster storm pummeling the West Coast and a fiery 40-car pileup in Wisconsin with freezing rain to blame. The path of destruction. ABC News follows the trail of the tornado strike two weeks ago that killed 76 people in Kentucky alone. The devastation discovered all along the 165 mile path and the hope survivors are finding as they begin to rebuild. This is the largest place we've been to in this part of the state. And yet it feels quieter and more still than any other place we've been to so far. And trading up, how one TikTok influencer with 5 million followers mastered trading, starting with a single one cent hairpin and spinning it all the way into a home. No wonder 2021 was the year TikTok passed Google in online popularity, how she plans to pay it forward. Well, good evening. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles for Lindsay Davis, and thank you for streaming with us. And we are, of course, tracking the rapid spread of Omicron across the country, just as millions are traveling for the holidays. And we have more on that in a moment. But first, we begin tonight with a manslaughter conviction in a trial involving a white police officer who killed a black man during a traffic stop after mistaking her gun for her taser. Former officer Kim Potter showed little emotion as the judge read the verdict guilty on both counts of manslaughter for fatally shooting 20-year-old Dante Wright in April. Inside the courtroom, Wright's mother sobbed. Outside, a crowd of supporters burst into celebration upon hearing the news. Among the evidence presented to the jury was body camera footage from that deadly confrontation. The judge denied bail, and Potter was led in handcuffs from the court the same court where former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was found guilty of killing George Floyd. ABC's Stephanie Ramos leads us off from Minneapolis. Miss Potter, please rise. Tonight, a Minneapolis jury that once seemed on the verge of deadlock convicting former police officer Kim Potter on two counts of manslaughter for shooting and killing 20-year-old Dante Wright. We, the jury on the charge of manslaughter in the first degree, find the defendant guilty. Potter showing no emotion as the verdict was read. Her husband calling out to her as she was put in handcuffs. Love you, Kim. Potter shot and killed Wright during a struggle after a traffic stop in April, reaching for her gun instead of her taser. <laughs> The jury saw this body camera video in which you can hear the 26-year veteran officer realize what she had done. I just shot him. Oh, wow. Do you swear? On the stand, she said it was all a terrible mistake. I'm sorry it happened. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> But for the jury, that was not a reason to acquit. You can feel sorry for Kim Potter, and you can believe she's guilty as a legal matter of the crimes that were charged. And I think that is likely what we saw here. Outside court, <laughs> cheers. Wright's mother describing a rush of feelings. The moment that we heard guilty on the um, manslaughter one, emotions, every single emotion that you could imagine just running through your body at that moment. 
On the day Dante Wright was killed, Minneapolis was already on edge. The trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin was underway in the murder of George Floyd. That trial taking place in the very same courtroom where Kim Potter was found guilty today. Stephanie Ramos joins us from Minneapolis. Stephanie, Potter asked to be out on bail until she faces sentencing, but the judge denied that request. So where is she now and what is the next step on finding out what exactly her sentence will be? Well, Kata, tonight Potter is behind bars, but you're exactly right. The judge denied the request from the defense to release Potter for Christmas. Uh, tonight she is behind bars, and we've just received her new mugshot. Here it is, seen here, smiling broadly. Potter will be sentenced February 18th, and she could serve up to 15 years in prison. Kata. Our thanks to you, Stephanie. And now I want to bring in attorney and ABC News contributor Shauna Lloyd. So, uh, Shauna, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely happy to be here. Earlier this afternoon, you actually said that you thought the jury would find Potter guilty of second degree manslaughter, but not first degree as well. So what do you think it was that convinced the jury to convict on both counts? I think what the jury saw was that this was something that was needless and didn't need to rise to the level of the force that she used. I think we also saw a jury that determined that through her training, she should have been aware that she was pulling a gun as opposed to a taser. And I think that's what the jury saw. They saw negligence on her part, and that rose to the level of manslaughter one. And you're saying you saw it. I mean, prosecutors there relied heavily on body camera footage from the shooting to build their case, saying Potter was reckless when she reached for her gun, not her taser. She also took the stand. You see it there to testify in her own defense. Do you think that this verdict shows perhaps the video from an incident is more reliable than in court personal testimony? You know, it's interesting. Video sometimes can be more powerful than in-court testimony, but the truth is when we're talking about these type of charges, the jury wants to hear from the defendant. They want to test your credibility. They want to see what you're like on the stand. They want to listen to the answers that you're being posed to the questions. So that's what the jurors really are looking for when you talk about this sort of testimony. In the video, what we saw, and I think which was very impactful for this jury, was we saw an officer who had two other officers inside the car there was a passenger, the vehicle was not stationary. And I think all of those things added to why the jury felt that this was something that was just negligent because there were so many other factors at play that created this reckless behavior. Well, the defense attorney is today asked for bail. They argued that Potter had no criminal history, had served as a police officer for 26 years, and according to her own testimony, had never abused power or received a complaint from the public. Her lawyer also saying she's not a flight risk. The judge denied that request. So what is your response to that decision? I think the judge made the right call. Typically, when we're looking at felonies that rise to this level of manslaughter and above, they are typically remanded into custody immediately after a jury is given a guilty verdict. So I don't find this very surprising at all. And Potter could face up to 15 years in prison. So tell us what to expect in the sentencing portion of this trial. Do you think she could actually face that maximum? Realistically, she's a first-time offender with no priors. I think that we are not looking at a maximum sentence in her case. I think we're going to be looking towards the lower end of the spectrum because of her prior history and the fact that she has no criminal history, no complaints. But there are some aggravating factors that the state is going to argue should increase her from the base portion of that sentence. So I think we're really going to end up somewhere in the mid-range with her, somewhere from three, possibly two, but under seven. I don't think we're looking at a max penalty here. All right, Shauna Lloyd, as always, we truly appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we turn now to the latest on the pandemic. And for many, that means a difficult search for those COVID tests ahead of the holiday. But as cases surge right here in the U.S., some potentially promising news from new studies on whether Omicron may be less severe than the Delta variant. ABC's Trevor Alt has the story. Tonight, millions scrambling to get tested before Christmas as the Omicron variant is driving a national surge. New cases more than doubling in three weeks, already surpassing the Delta variant's peak. 
But tonight, new data out of the UK suggests Omicron patients may be 50 to 70 percent less likely to be hospitalized. These early reports, they do suggest that the risk of hospitalization is lower than Delta. And that, of course, is, is good. That's encouraging news. Officials in South Africa say their data also shows Omicron may be more mild, though experts caution it's still too early to know for sure. And for the second day in a row, the FDA authorizing a COVID-19 pill, this time from Merck, shown to reduce the risk of severe illness 30 percent, far less than the 89 percent reduction from Pfizer's pill, though that won't be widely available for months. That combined with vaccinations and everything else we're doing really should allow us to start putting the pandemic in the rearview mirror. The problem is supply. That's also the problem with testing. In the face of this unprecedented demand, Americans sometimes waiting in line for hours, pharmacies running out of at-home tests. We have not been able to find rapid tests or any tests really anywhere. And there's concern the Biden administration's promised half a billion tests won't arrive until well after the holidays. David pressing the president. We're nearly two years into this pandemic. You're a year into the presidency empty shelves and no test kits in some places uh, three days before Christmas when it's so important. Uh, is that good enough? No, nothing's been good enough. But look, look where we are. When last Christmas we were in a situation where we had significantly fewer vaccinated people vaccinated, emergency rooms were filled, you had serious backups in hospitals that were causing great difficulties. Um, we're in a situation now where we have 200 million people fully vaccinated. Today, ABC questioning the press secretary about the president's answer. I think what the president was acknowledging, which he said in his speech a couple days ago as well, is that we're not where we need to be on testing. No one is saying we are. Even with that testing shortage, New York City is still reporting its daily caseload is up a staggering 756 percent since Thanksgiving. Today, the mayor announcing New Year's Eve in Times Square will be a scaled back event with vaccines and masks required. I want to be really clear with everyone. It's going to be a tough few weeks, but it will only be a few weeks. And with Israel now recommending a fourth shot, the president telling David that's a possibility here, too. This would be the fourth shot for people 60 and older and for frontline medical workers. Is that something you're considering? I listen to the scientist, and I'm sure the scientist is paying very close attention to that. There may be a need for another booster, but that remains to be seen. Even former President Trump, while still against vaccine mandates, is speaking out in favor of the shots. The ones that get very sick and go to the hospital are the ones that don't take their vaccine, but it's still their choice. And if you take the vaccine, you're protected. In Minnesota, this hospital bringing in a refrigerated truck after its morgue reached capacity. And Minnesota ICU nurse Lauren Lechleiter says while she doesn't speak on behalf of her employer, at her hospital, nearly every ICU bed is taken and at least 95% are unvaccinated. It's really, really immensely difficult to deal with death, death every day that could have been prevented. Wow. And Trevor joining us now from a testing site there in Times Square. So Trevor, we know the Omicron variant's rapid spread is also creating staffing shortages. And late today, the CDC actually updated its quarantine guidance for healthcare workers. So what are they recommending at this point? Well, Kendra, these updated uh, recommendations are for healthcare workers who have been vaccinated and received a booster. They now no longer have to quarantine at home if they've had a high risk exposure. And those who have been infected but don't have symptoms can return to work with a negative test after just seven days rather than 10. And that timeline actually can be shrunk even further if there's a staffing shortage. Kena. All right, Trevor, thank you so much. The surge in Omicron cases coming as millions of Americans are hitting the road and taking to the air on what is expected to be the busiest travel day of the year ahead of this holiday weekend. Airports are packed today across the country while severe weather is complicating the journey for millions. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, fiery crashes as millions take to the roads. 
in Jackson County, Wisconsin, freezing rain to blame for this chain reaction crash this morning. Up to 40 cars and 20 semi trucks, some engulfed in flames. At least 20 people injured. The highway still shut down tonight. That system heading into the northeast. Meanwhile, in the west, and, uh, we do have some ah! breaking news. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Our Sacramento affiliate, News 10, broadcasting on the freeway before dawn. Watch again that car hydroplaning across the road and into the ditch. The news crew going back to help, hit by another vehicle. In San Mateo County, two people drowning in their cars. They attempted to gain entry into the, the second vehicle. Um, however, they, the conditions were changing rapidly. The water was rising quickly, and it became a little too dangerous for, for first responders. The system bringing big-time snow to the mountains will car in Soda Springs. The snow here has been relentless. It's going to pound into the weekend. The highest elevations are going to get up to 10 feet, and it's creating dangerous driving conditions. This is I-80 East. You can see it's a standstill. There have been several spin-outs up ahead, and authorities are holding traffic. And air travel is peaking. Wednesday's numbers already surpassing numbers for the same date pre-pandemic. Elwin Lopez is at the nation's busiest Hartsfield Jackson in Atlanta. Of the 2.2 million people expected to take to the skies every single day during the holidays, airport officials here in Atlanta tell me 3.7 million of them are going to come through here. And amid the crowds at Newark Airport, a TSA agent hailed a hero tonight, jumping over the conveyor belt to save a choking baby. Her 10 years experience as an EMT coming in handy. And Kano, one of the most congested roadways to be on this evening right here in Chicago. I-290 West heading out of the city. A 240% increase in traffic is expected across the country. The roadways will be busy. 100 million people driving this holiday. Kana. Well, Alex, thank you so much. And now let's get right to our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, with what these holiday travelers can really expect. Good evening to you, Ginger. Good evening to you, Kena. Well, it's brisk out here, and you know any precipitation that comes through is going to be the frozen type, and that's what we're going to see. The same storm that kind of caused those bursts of snow and all the accidents in Wisconsin now moves through the Northeast and New England overnight tonight through early tomorrow. So if you are traveling I-95 up through Connecticut and Rhode Island to Boston, 7 a.m., we stop the clock there, even 91 from Springfield down to Hartford. This is that light snow, but as you saw, it does not take much, right? An inch, two inches can make those roads plenty slick. Let's go west, though. It's not an inch or two. It's a foot or two in the Rockies and up to 10 feet in the Sierra. There are avalanche warnings, flood watches that include Palm Springs, San Diego, parts of Anaheim all could see one to three inches of rain and of course any burn scar could cause mudslides rock slides that's something to watch for as we go into Christmas Eve it's going to be windy in New Mexico and parts of Texas but look at this ahead of that system it could be the warmest Christmas Eve and Christmas Day for many from Texas to Oklahoma to Missouri on record so we're talking 90s our Dan Peck found a 91 for Graham Texas there that's a toasty one for Christmas Eve, Kena. Wow, Ginger, thank you. Well, watching some of your forecasts actually gave me goosebumps, and we have our rain boots on here in Los Angeles. Our thanks to you, Ginger. Thank you. And when we come back, the dramatic video out of Peru, the investigation into what went wrong, also tribute pouring in tonight for a renowned author. But first, this journey, our team traveled along that devastating Kentucky tornado's entire 165 mile path, and amid the devastation, found hope. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Welcome back, everybody. It's been nearly two weeks since a rare December long track tornado devastated several communities across the state of Kentucky and elsewhere. In the immediate aftermath, people gathered towards the biggest pockets of destruction, but a lot of damage has gone on scene. So ABC Audio's Brad Milkey, host of the Start Here podcast, traveled along the tornado's entire 165 mile path. And despite the devastation, he found hope in the survivors as they work to pick up the pieces. All right, so this is the field where this all began. Just looked like dozens of tornadoes that day. The difference is most of those tornadoes dissipated quickly. This one, just kept going. It stayed on the ground and didn't stop sprinting for 165 miles. Within minutes of touching down, this tornado descended on its first town. We drove through half a dozen communities in Kentucky to witness the scope of the devastation. They were easy to find. Hey, Brad, yeah. Chief Adams, Fulton County Fire and Rescue. Our first stop, the fire station in Casey, Kentucky, or what's left of it. This is the spot? This is the station, and that's the pile of what's left. This is one of the original groups. We meet with Fire oh. Chief Wade Adams. Two of his own firefighters lost their homes as town after town plunged into total darkness. Nothing can, can prepare you for walking up here to your station, realizing it's not here, and hearing your community members screaming in the streets. One person was killed in this town of less than 100. That victim's house disintegrated. But next door, the house is still standing, barely. Inside it is Renee Nolan. It's been devastating. Yeah. You know, everything around me is gone. She had just had surgery on her hand the day before the storm. But as it crashed into her home, her stitches were ripped out. She doesn't have the money to afford a hotel while her house gets repaired, so she's making do with a tarp over the roof and a small heater. But she says she hasn't been left wanting for donations of food or propane. The community has been wonderful. People have come from miles and miles around and, you know, it restored my faith in, in humanity. One of the most difficult things here is just to convey how long this tornado was on the ground here. So I actually got a map just to show the scope of this. It actually starts here. Uh, just across the Tennessee border, and then it just continues on almost this straight line up through Mayfield. This is the town you've seen so many images of in the days after the tornado hit. A community of 10,000 people, the most populated town on this long path. Absolute devastation. And yet, as you drive through it, the images really can't convey the magnitude. This is the largest place we've been to in this part of the state. 
and yet it feels quieter and more still than any other place we've been to so far. Wow. Just off the main road, we meet a homeowner named Vicky. She doesn't want to be on camera, but she did invite us in to see what remains of her home. Her living room, tattered. Her bedroom, ripped to shreds by the power of this storm. Vicky's bedroom is now missing its roof. All you really got here now are uh, things that were on her walls, her decoration of her bedroom. And that's the rest of her neighborhood. Street after street, home after home, the tattered remains of a town, Main Street America, in ruins. We were ready for, you know, the zombie apocalypse, but not this. Our next stop, Gilbertsville. With little warning, its residents met the same fate as the towns before it. What does a tornado sound like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying. I'm Rick Smock and his wife Linda were in their home when this tornado screamed up over a hill. They had a chance to get to the strongest part of their house, a little hallway by the garage door. Here's where we were, and you can see the baseboards are even pulled loose. See where it's not connected? It, it, oh, wow. The whole house. So you're, you're thinking to yourself, raising. this is the strongest place we can be, well, here's, and still the baseboards are being pulled Yeah, you can see the baseboards out. have been pulled loose. They reveal that their son, Jason, had just moved back in with them because he has brain cancer. Stuck on the other side of the house in these short, terrifying moments, their concern, once again, was keeping their son safe. I'm sure it was only 30 or 45 seconds. Soon the after the storm passed, with ceiling beams dangling above her, a garage shifted 20 feet off its foundation. Close. Linda rushed through her home, digging through her family's belongings. This is Jason's uh, bear I found. <laughs> <laughs> that he had it from a baby. If I don't have things like this to hold on to, I, I feel like I'm not going to have anything to this. Freeman, Kentucky is a small farming community, population 300. But this tiny town suffered 11 deaths, a proportion big enough where every single resident knows someone whose life was lost, plus the losses that don't make the newspaper. The dog was laying there on the floor. And I got him down home, and I built him a nice box, and I put some fresh straw in for him, and uh, put a little pillow under his head, put a couple milk bones in there for a little snack along the way. Even in so much chaos, compassion remains the currency here. Throughout the week, aid groups and volunteers descended on the area, providing food, electricity, basic needs. But what aid experts say is crucial to understand is that need is not going to go away anytime soon. The Kentucky state government is setting up a fund called the Team Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund, something Governor Andy Bashir is hoping will be a more consistent form of support for everyone who needs it. We arrive in a quiet field, not unlike where this twister began. It's calm and peaceful, despite being the endpoint of this historic rampage. This is actually the spot where this tornado ceased to be a tornado. At 11.47, not even three hours later, it finally goes back up into the sky. This 165 mile path will leave a scar on this state, but there's still a chance, whether through neighbors or through officials bringing aid or through the rest of us, to help that scar begin to heal. Wow, Brad Milkey, that was a great story. I'm still ahead here on Prime. Could you imagine starting with a hairpin and ending up with a home after a series of trades? It is actually possible. And coming up, we will hear from the TikTok sensation who did just that. Also, at long last, the world's most powerful space telescope is ready to launch. And the millions traveling today to see their loved ones, we go by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Prince Harry and Meghan share their 2021 holiday card with the world with their son and their daughter. The first images you're seeing of their six-month-old daughter, Lilibet. They're also raising awareness for charitable causes they've supported, like Afghan refugee resettlement. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. 
there were so many murders happening, it had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back, let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. And welcome back, everybody. The Omicron surge this close to Christmas could make some holiday travelers think twice, but some is not all. It is estimated that Americans will travel this year in ways they haven't since before the pandemic. So here is holiday travel 2021 by the numbers. 109 million. That is AAA's top line number for how many Americans will travel 50 or more miles this holiday season by plane, train, and automobile. A 34% increase over Christmas 2020. 2 million. That's how many passengers were screened at TSA airport checkpoints Wednesday, nearly doubling last year's headcount on the same day. And today is expected to be even busier. 37,000, that is the fine an unruly passenger could face for mid-air misbehavior. That's per violation, by the way, as the FAA says reported cases jumped in 2021. And 329, that is the average price Americans will pay for a gallon of gas when they fill up today. It's about double that here in Los Angeles, but it is down 10 cents from a month ago, but still more than double, more than a dollar above last year's price at the pump at this time. And 1 p.m., that is what time you want to be on the road if you are visiting friends and family by car tomorrow on Christmas Eve. Any later, it's going to be a real Scrooge. Traffic starts to pick up starting at 2. I will say my parents arrived safely with brownies and gingerbread in tow. So to all of you traveling this year, please be safe. And still ahead here on Prime, a new Chris Noth accuser comes forward, the allegations they are making, and the mystery illness that has killed dozens of people in Sudan, now under investigation by the World Health Organization tonight, and the lessons learned from the 50-year fight to cure cancer. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Time, anytime. Nightline. 
is an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. of cheers and celebrations outside of a Minneapolis courtroom in the moment a judge read the verdict in the trial of Kim Potter, who shot and killed Dante Wright during a traffic stop in April. We, the jury on the charge of manslaughter in the first degree, find the defendant guilty. Kim Potter found guilty on both first and second degree manslaughter charges. Dante Wright's mother describing the moment she heard the verdict. Um, I kind of let out a yelp because it was built up in the anticipation of what was to come when, while we were waiting for the last few days. For weeks, the jury sat through hours of testimony. Kim Potter taking the stand in her own defense, tearfully telling the jury she meant to use her taser on Dante Wright instead of her gun. Two days before Christmas, the holiday travel rush in full effect despite growing concern about the Omicron COVID variant. As millions embark on their journeys, the FDA authorized the second of two COVID treatment pills now available for emergency use. Both Pfizer and Merck's treatments will be limited to adults who are at high risk of severe illness. I think it's going to end up making a really enormous difference. The problem is in the short run, we're just not going to have a lot of this. Meanwhile, Americans are forming long lines at testing centers across the country as positivity rates continue to skyrocket among the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Nationwide, the U.S. is now averaging nearly 161,000 new COVID-19 cases every day, up by 36% in the last week. Two major developments in the Supreme Court. Former President Trump filing an appeal asking the court today to block the release of White House records to the January 6th committee investigating the Capitol riots. Mr. Trump's team arguing the former president had a constitutional right to block the materials despite President Biden's decision not to invoke executive privilege over them. Meanwhile, the court said last night it would take up challenges to the Biden administration's federal vaccine mandates for hospitals and large businesses.
witnesses. An expedited hearing is scheduled for January 7th. Joan Didion is dead at 87. Didion came to prominence in the 1960s with her social commentary that explored post-war American life, from the hippie generation to politics. But her most acclaimed novel, a memoir, came after tragedy. The Year of Magical Thinking was written after the sudden death of her husband. In 2013, she was awarded a National Medal of Arts and Humanities by President Obama. Joan Didion died of complications from Parkinson's disease. Space fans are in for a very special Christmas this year. The James Webb Telescope, which has been in the works since 1996, will launch from Kourou, French Guinea, on Christmas morning. The telescope will operate roughly 1 million miles away from Earth and succeed the Hubble Space Telescope. The $10 billion project is funded by NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency, and has seen numerous delays in its construction and launch until now. The space window is currently slated to open at 7.20 a.m. Eastern Time Saturday. Choosing the right. Word. Hesitation proved costly for this Wheel of Fortune contestant who correctly solved the puzzle but did not win the grand prize Audi Q3 because she paused for too long. It's got to be more or less continuous. We'll, we'll allow for a little pause, but not for <laughs> five seconds. But Audi is stepping up to help, tweeting, You're a winner in our eyes, Charlene. Now let's get you a prize offering to give her the Audi Q3 she missed out on. And tonight, another woman came forward today to accuse Sex in the City actor Chris Noth of sexual assault. Singer Lisa Gentili says the, accident, the incident happened in 2002. She is the first Noth accuser to publicly identify herself. Two other women also say the actor assaulted them. He denies any wrongdoing. Kaylee Hartung has that story. Tonight, a new accuser coming forward, alleging actor Chris Noth sexually abused her. He warned me that if I ever told a soul about what happened the night before, that he would ruin my career. Lisa Gentili, a singer and songwriter, says in 2002, Noth offered her a ride home from a New York restaurant they both frequented. She says he then asked to see her apartment, where she claims he forced himself on her, aggressively kissing and groping her. I finally managed to push him away and get out of his grasp and, and yelled, no, I don't want this. Gentilly did not report this to authorities at that time. She's now speaking out just days after two women claimed to The Hollywood Reporter that they were both sexually assaulted by him. One in Los Angeles in 2004, the other in New York in 2015. Noth denying those first two allegations as categorically false, calling the encounters consensual. And Kana, police tell us there's no investigation into these allegations. But since these claims have surfaced, Noth has been fired from his CBS show, The Equalizer, and dropped by his talent agency. Kana. Kaylee, thank you. And we're tracking several headlines around the world tonight. Traumatic video out of Lima, Peru, showing a truck ramming into a moving train as it tries to cross the rail tracks. What's amazing here is that nobody was harmed, but rescue teams were on site. They were trying to get the truck driver who was stuck inside the vehicle. Russian President Vladimir Putin held his annual end of the year press conference today. The big question at hand, whether Russia would invade Ukraine after an unprecedented Russian military buildup on the Ukrainian border over the last few weeks. Putin responded that Russia, quote, does not want any military action, but also said that the ball was in NATO's court and asked that they stop their movement to the east. And the WHO is investigating a mysterious illness in South Sudan that has killed nearly 100 people. Deaths have been mostly reported among the elderly and in children ages 1 to 14 in the northern part of the country. And today marks 50 years since former President Richard Nixon signed the landmark National Cancer Act, which launched the war on cancer. And tonight we examine a new deal for cancer, lessons from a 50-year war. It's a collection of essays from experts taking a look at the medicine and the money involved in this decades-long battle to tackle the elusive disease while offering new plans to deliver progress and hope for cancer patients. So joining us now is Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. He is the chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania and a notable contributor to this book. Dr. Emanuel, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My great pleasure. 
So let's start with a note here from the publication's introduction, which says the book's goal really is to explore everything beyond the science of cancer. So talk a little bit about why that is so important for Americans to understand. Well, first of all, the 50 years tells you a lot. We really are at a golden age of cancer treatment at the moment. Uh, we have immunotherapies, we have CAR T cell therapy, uh, we really have uh, learned how to cure a number of cancers and prolong the lives of patients with many other cancers that we can't cure. Uh, we have a lot of targeted therapies, uh, but it's taken 50 years of work. Uh, it took a lot longer than going to the moon. Uh, and it just shows you how complicated a problem it is. I think that's very important for people to understand, especially when we look at other problems that we're trying to solve, like Alzheimer's disease. It takes a long time to understand the biology, get the treatments, test them out in people, and show that they really make a material difference of prolonging life or uh, dramatically improving the quality of life. Absolutely. And specifically here, your chapter focuses on the high cost of cancer and the care in the U.S. And notes here that in 2018, patients with cancer in the United States paid $5.6 billion in out-of-pocket costs for their cancer drug or perhaps their biologic treatment. So what are some of the biggest problems in how we pay for cancer? Well, the first thing is that the cost of the drugs for cancer has just skyrocketed. Uh, 25 years ago, it was about $1,000 a drug. Now we're well over 120, closer to 150,000 when you take a drug. And so uh, this has just become uh, a hugely outrageous cost. Um, and it, one of the major problems is we let drug companies set the prices. No other company really does that. We give them patents, we give them exclusivity, and then They've got this monopoly and they set the prices. And we know what happens when you give someone a monopoly to set prices. They just go up and up and up. And so outside of these set prices, though, here, what are some of your recommendations for lowering the cost of cancer care? I know you've mentioned stopping even aggressive treatment in these end-of-life cancers. Well, I, I think that there are probably three important things we can do, maybe four. The first is obviously, as you mentioned, bring the price of the treatments down, make them more reasonable, certainly make them much more comparable to what is being charged in the rest of the world. The second is we have a lot of unnecessary care that is being given, care that's not proven to improve the quality of life or prolong the life, um, and we have to stop that. One of those is, as you mentioned, for a lot of patients who have metastatic disease, we've tried one treatment, we've tried a second treatment, and there's no evidence that the third and fourth treatment are gonna make any difference, and yet they're very frequently given uh, because people either don't wanna give up or very commonly, doctors are very fearful of bringing uh, or, or initiating that discussion about the end of life, that we don't have a treatment that is going to stop the growth of your cancer. So that's a second, get rid of unnecessary services. A third is get rid of inefficiently delivered services. We have a lot of services where we can deliver it a lot more cheaply and more effectively than currently. And the last thing we can do, as you point out, is give better palliative care to patients instead of admitting them to the hospital, get them to get care at home, have more hospice care. That's what patients want. They tell that that to doctors over and over again, and we need to be able to deliver that. In your opinion, what are the most glaring lessons that you have learned in this 50-year war on cancer? Well, the most important lesson is it takes a long time. It, the biology is hard. The second important lesson is we need a closer link between the advances we do in the laboratory and clinical trials to get to decide whether that laboratory advance really makes a difference in terms of, again, improving uh, the overall survival of patients and or uh, improving their quality of life. And those clinical trials are hard to do. They take a lot of time. They're very expensive. Um, they're one of the reasons that it takes time between the discoveries and when we get those treatments approved. And I think if we could get more people enrolled in clinical trials, faster, that would make a huge difference. That is what we really have to do going forward across all medicine, not just in cancer.
Well, Dr. Emanuel, we thank you so much for your time tonight. And a new deal for cancer is available now wherever books are sold. Thank you very much. Coming up on Prime, meet the TikTok sensation who was able to trade her way all the way from a one cent bobby pin to a home. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the award for overall excellence in television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. Welcome back, everybody. We now turn to our weekly segment featuring a TikTok influencer. TikTok, which was the internet's most visited site in 2021, has really provided us some amazing stories. And tonight, it's for a great cause. Joining us now is Demi Skipper, better known to her 5 million TikTok followers as the woman who mastered trading up a single hairpin. Wait, I have one right here something just like this, all the way to a house. So let's take a look. For the last year and a half, I've been on a quest to trade a single bobby pin up until I get to a house. After 28 trades and all the ups and downs, I finally did it. Okay, <laughs> we're walking up to it. This feels so surreal. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, it's hard to believe. Demi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. First of all, congratulations on your beautiful thank new you. home in Tennessee. You have to admit, this is quite an unconventional story on how to become a homeowner. So first of all, how did you get into trading? And sort of tell us why you started off specifically with a hairpin. Yeah, so in May of 2020, I think like a lot of us, I was sitting at my house watching a lot more TV than I should, and I came across a YouTube video about a guy that had done just this, but with a red paper clip. 
And so immediately I start Googling, has anyone else ever done this? Because it was 20 years ago. And surprisingly, no one had. So I looked around my own house and thought, what do I have a lot of? I buy them in packs of 100 and I found a single bobby pin and I was like, this is going to be a house someday. Wow, buy them in packs of 100, I hear you. So walk us through this trading process. I read that you were sort of waking up early in the morning, you were jumping on several sites, asking people to trade with you. How much of your life did you spend doing this? So much. I mean, I work a full-time job. So my nine to five is just working a normal job and then like 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and then late into the night, I'm working on trades. So even in the last week, I've been waking up being like, okay, what trade do I need? And then I'm like, wait, I have the house. We're good. I don't need to be looking for anything right now. <laughs> yeah, hard to settle down. Was the goal here always to get a house? And in order to get there, what was your most challenging trade? Yeah, it was always the house. So when I saw the guy 20 years ago who had done it, he had done it to a house. And honestly, I just was like, is it possible? Can I prove, like, it's such a wild thing to trade something so small for something so big that I thought, let's make it the smallest thing I can find all the way to the biggest thing I can think of. Um, I think the hardest thing, honestly, every single trade was different, but there was a couple trades which involved borders. So getting something from Canada into the US, which caused a lot of problems during COVID or cars, trying to figure out how to get a car across the country given the pandemic. So there were a lot of challenges that I felt like took me months to figure out, but we always ended up figuring them out. There you are driving a tractor. And I'm not sure if you <laughs> had that in mind. <laughs> yeah, never, never in a million years. And, and you mentioned the cars here. I mean, you had a few of these luxury trades. You had a MacBook Pro, a Peloton, not just one car, you had four. There was a tiny cabin on wheels. I mean, you could have counted that as a house. What, was there one that you thought, I wish I had kept that? Oh, definitely. I don't have a car of my own. I, I just <laughs> don't own a car. And so many yeah. of the cars, there were four in total that I traded over the course of the 28 trades. A couple times I was like, man, you know, I could keep this car. This could be really great but I knew that I had to keep going for the house. Oh, good for you. And finally, the house that you traded for, you're renovating. You plan to find a deserving person to trade it back to for yet another hairpin. So when you started off, was that always the goal there to do something good? And did people you were trading with know that you had this altruistic plan? You know, it really, I, I think the goal was to try and figure out originally if it was possible. And then as mm -hmm. I sort of like built this following and heard from people and started trading with people all around the US, honestly, so many people were asking, how do you, how do I do this? How can I get my own house? I have this dream. And so at that point, I think like halfway through, I was like, this isn't for me. I'm proving it's possible, but there is someone out there that really, really needs this house. And as I kept going, I felt even better and even better about being able to give this house away. It feels even better to be able to give it to somebody else, honestly, and then start the whole journey again. Oh, I love to hear that. And you are going to do it again, right? Yeah, absolutely. That, that house is going to get traded for a bobby pin, and then we're going again. Oh, we can't wait to follow your journey. Demi, we appreciate you joining us and sharing your story. Thank you so much, and happy holidays. Well, thank you so much for having me. Now to a retired Marine stepping up to give Kentucky tornado victims a much needed reason to smile this holiday season. Lindsay Davis has the story. Retired Marine Sean Triplett doesn't just have the thick beard and rosy cheeks. Turns out he has the heart of Santa to boot. Something Mayfield, Kentucky is witnessing firsthand where just 13 days ago, a tornado upended lives and minimally put a damper on the holidays. I've deployed three times and I've, I've seen the worst. It's an absolute war zone, just destruction everywhere. Triplett rushed to see how he could help, traveling around the city before stopping at a shelter. I saw this, you know, boy about seven, six or seven years old. You know, he's crying in his mom's arms, and she's trying to compose herself and keep it together. And, you know, he, he told her, he said, I lost my Christmas. Um, and it really hit me. After he posted this picture from inside a damaged movie theater, it went viral. I reached out to my social media friends and family, and I said, let's get to work. And so we started raising money. Support for his holiday mission came pouring in from all over the world. In just over a week, he's raised nearly $95,000 and partnered with a local Walmart. Triplett and his hardworking team of local volunteers wrapping each gift. They probably wrapped close to 4,000 toys in like three days. It was an assembly line uh, of epic proportions and they were so good at it. 
Once the gifts are tied with a Christmas bow, Triplett puts on his red hat and coat, whitens his beard, and gets to work. So far, he and his volunteers have given out more than 20,000 toys and counting. If we can distract them from that trauma, um, even for just a few hours, uh, it, it can mean the world to them. Wow, lots of happy kids, thanks to him. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, Santa visiting children during a Christmas meal distribution near Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Look at that, a total of 1,500 meals were given out, and you see all those smiles as well. Well, that's our show for this hour, so please stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for streaming with us.